So Rebecca had invited me to uh, talk with you all today. And the topic she told me was, what is art? So that of course is a fascinating topic. And I'd like you incidentally to write down any questions that you have because I would love to answer whatever questions you have at the end of the conversation that I'm going to uh, present to you now. So of course, this is a very, very big topic and it's a constantly changing topic. And in my own lifetime, I've seen the topic go from what I consider to be a high point to what I now consider to be a very low point. In other words, it would seem that in this world that we live in right now, 2021, almost everything is art. It's like whatever it is, it's art. And almost everyone's an artist uh, and everyone's a curator. Now, I don't agree with any of that at all. So I just wanna say that up front. I think it's a real uh, trivialization of a very important word and a very important concept in, in our lives and in our culture. So I went, I went back in time to just look up a couple, of, uh, a couple of definitions about art from people I have respected. And the first one I'm going to read to you now is Tolstoy. Tolstoy's definition of art was art is, which is that which makes beauty manifest. And beauty is that which pleases without exciting desire. So art seems in most definitions, uh, I'm talking mostly about visual art actually, to be connected with beauty. Art and beauty are kind of linked uh, uh, and, and, and many great thinkers of the past had that connection in their mind. As an aside, uh, we live in a culture right now, which in many instances does not value beauty at all. In other words, if I have a art dealer, or let's say I have a person from a museum come to my studio, a hypothetical, and I say, I'm trying to make beautiful paintings, that would actually be the wrong answer. I know that's hard to believe. It's certainly hard for me to believe. In other words, the right answer would be something like, I wanna show political problems. So that is what art has always been thought to be. And in our culture now, what art in many areas, in many circles is considered to be is more a political identity issue than the issue of making beautiful paintings, sculpture, photographs, books, whatever it is. So I'm just throwing these different ideas out to you. Now, Mark Rothko is a painter who died in 1970. If you don't know the work of Mark Rothko, you should definitely look it up uh, and you should go to see it if, if possible. It's certainly hanging in many locations. Mark Rothko also was interested in making paintings that had beauty. And his definition of beauty was an expression of rightness, that beauty had to do with an expression of rightness. Beauty also had to do in general with the idea or concept of perfection. When everything was perfect, the artwork was beautiful. Now, beautiful was a very, very high compliment. To make a beautiful painting is a, is a tremendous achievement. Let's say Rembrandt makes, makes beautiful paintings, which also have feeling. So another aspect of beauty is the ability to create feeling for the viewer. And that is something which in many instances is not effective in, the, in a lot of the work that is being shown today. There is, there is no feeling at all. Uh, for example, uh, I'm not giving an art history lecture here, so I'll keep that to the minimum. It is a topic I could talk about for seven or eight hours straight, <laughs> but pop art, for example, to my mind, and you might know what that is. These are terms you should know as college students. Pop art does not have feeling. So right there, it fails because art, great art creates feeling in the viewer, allows the viewer 
to have feeling, even if it's just a feeling of, ex not even, a including a feeling of excitement at looking at something beautiful because beauty is not commonplace, it's rare. So as I was just saying, uh, in our own time, there has been a devaluation of beauty. In my own lifetime, there has been a devaluation of beauty. When I started my career, we're gonna be looking at some of my early paintings in the late 60s and early 70s. I was definitely trying to make beautiful paintings, no, no question, and nobody else was questioning that either. That was, that, had, that was still the goal, as it had been for Monet, as it had been for Picasso, as it had been for uh, Rembrandt. Yes, beauty was the goal. Now, it started in around the 80s that suddenly beauty, I don't know, suddenly, maybe it wasn't that sudden, sudden uh, eventually beauty became demoted. And so there's another painter who uh, I'm gonna mention, you certainly can look him up after the class. His name is Morris Lewis, and he had a very large show at the Museum of Modern Art in the 80s, 86, I believe. And it was a very, very beautiful show. He's a great colorist. And he had the ability to create form and color in such a way that the viewer was pleased or thrilled. And so that he gave you that experience of, of beauty. But the art critic of the moment, who was the art critic for Time Magazine at that moment, said at the end of the article, these are beautiful paintings, but is beauty enough? So many people, myself included, were a little concerned by that remark. What this man was now saying, this famous art critic is, well, great, yeah, he can make a beautiful painting, but is that what you want? <laughs> so that was a real, that was a kind of a shift that I'm also throwing out to you. Now, earlier, Immanuel Kant, in his uh, critique of aesthetic judgment, wrote a great deal about beauty, taste, and art. And uh, he had a very specific attitude about the term beautiful. He didn't mean pretty and he didn't mean attractive and he didn't mean decorative. He meant, uh, he meant something that was uh, of interest only in society. It was absolute and there was, this is a fascinating part of it. There was no more or less beautiful. Beautiful was a particular term and solid. Because if you start saying more or less, you're not talking about something beautiful. And uh, so he said it was absolute. And he said that the pretty deals with agreeableness, the beauty with aesthetics, which Kant called the judgment of taste. So the judgment of taste is, you look at something and then you make a judgment and that is actually your taste. So if I look at a Rembrandt, I would say, well, that's really great. So my taste is coming into play in that uh, evaluation. Now, he said that, <clears throat> that, he said that uh, taste is the faculty of estimating an object or mode of, represent of representation by means of a delight or aversion apart from self-interest. So if I tell you my dog is beautiful, that's not what we're talking about because I have self-interest there, it's my dog. But if I tell you the Eiffel Tower is beautiful, that's not gonna change my life one way or the other. It's my judgment about the Eiffel Tower. Uh, Kant called the artist a person who wishes to create beauty. Now, I certainly fell into that category. That's why I, that's why I wanted to make art. I, I, two reasons. I wanted to create beautiful things and I wanted to show feeling at the same time. Those were, those were, you can decide, you can decide 
when I show the slides where I achieved that. I didn't say I achieved it. That's I said I wanted to do that. And um, this is also a very, very marvelous, uh, to my way of thinking, definition. He called genius. So we call an a artist who's great. Let's say we're talking about Michelangelo. Uh, we would say Michelangelo is a genius without any doubt. I mean, not only is he a painter, but he's a sculptor, more known as a sculptor, and he's also an architect. And the way Kant described that is that genius is a talent for reproducing that for which there are no definite rules. And that's one reason why art and writing and music are so hard, because I can't tell you, well, now just go home and mix these colors and put this on the canvas and wait three hours and it will be beautiful. There are no rules, absolutely none. So that's another, another idea to think about. And then finally, uh, I wanted to give you a quote of uh, the writer Marcel Proust, who wrote a great uh, book called The Search for Lost Time. Uh, it's six volumes. So he said, thanks to art, instead of one world only, our own, we see that world multiply itself and we have at our disposal as many worlds as there are original artists. Worlds more different one from the other than those which resolve, revolve in infinite space. Worlds which centuries from the extinction of the fire from which their light first emanated, whether it was called Rembrandt or Vermeer, send us still, each one, its special radiance. And that's a kind of a long quote, but the, the point of it is, just to paraphrase, is that you had a person alive called Vermeer, another very great painter who was full of life and creating those pictures. And we still have Vermeer four or 500 years later because his, his spark is still shining in his work. And we know Vermeer, and we also know that we are not Vermeer. That's, that makes life much more exciting. And the final thing I'm going to say is that human beings, to the best of our knowledge, are the only animals capable of creating and experiencing beauty. What a marvelous capacity. <clears throat> the, the chance to be taken above the ordinary and the mundane and, exp and exp experience the best that human beings are capable of. We have many reminders everywhere about the worst that human beings are capable of, but beauty is the best that human beings are capable of. Okay, thank you. So let's look at some of my paintings. Okay, I'm gonna try to screen share here. Okay. Is this okay. working? Yeah, okay, right. So sorry for the writing on the uh, right side. So this is just a, a JPEG. Yeah, so maybe you can zoom in on it a little more. Okay, great. So this is called Spiked Red and it's from 1969. You know, I was uh, 28 when I did the painting. And uh, these are the first paintings that I ever did, which were publicly exhibited. Uh, they're abstract paintings and they're about color and movement and feeling. And uh, they're very, very large. Uh, can you just uh, lower that a little so I can see the size? Yeah, so this is, this is seven feet by over 10 feet. So, you know, this is in the discussion of what is art. So this is a painting of a contemporary uh, American artist at that time uh, using color and shape to create this kind of movement uh, on a wall. These were paintings that were made to be 
shown on a whole wall because anything that's seven feet by over 10 feet can't have anything else near it. Okay, next please. Okay, so this is another painting from that same period. And you can see that I'm wor working with these kind of wave shapes uh, or curving shapes. It has many, many connections to the human body, to females, to water, and also just to itself. Uh, I actually had arrived at this format doing logarithmic progressions. And I'm not going to be showing you those paintings. They are on my website if you're interested in seeing them, which I did earlier while I was still in graduate school. And that was plotting curves. So I uh, had a kind of a very strong sense of how curves might work on a flat two-dimensional surface. And uh, th then I kind of uh, uh, let the structure go a little bit, or in many instances, quite a bit, as you'll see. Okay, next, please. Right, so this, these are paintings that are in museum collections. This is, this is in the Hirshhorn Museum in uh, Washington, DC. Again, seven feet by over 10 feet, the, a huge expanse of canvas on a big wall. Uh, these paintings were made flat on the floor and I walked on them to make the painting. I just was a body. <laughs> walking in the middle of the painting, doing it with, with, with color and uh, with color, just with color and uh, water basically, because it's a water-based paint. Okay. This is another painting. These are all, these are all from the same year, which is to me right now, you know, kind of interesting that I did this many paintings uh, that I think are of this quality in 1969. Uh, again, the same size, uh, almost in this case, almost seven feet by, uh, by over 10 feet uh, called Yaki. I, I guess I felt that there was some kind of a, a abandoned like, a, like what, a, what an American Indian as I imagined an American Indian when the pilgrims first came here, my experience. So I gave it a, the, the name of an Indian. They were kind of fast and emotional paintings. Uh, and I wanted the viewer to experience the, you could say joy that I had in making them in the moment. It was very exciting to make the paintings. Okay. And this is, this is a painting which I still have. Most of the paintings I no longer have because they were acquired by people or museums at the time when I painted them through gallery sales. But I kept some for myself. And so some I still have now. And this is the one that I, this is one of the ones that I, that I still have, uh, which is called Springs Fireplace because that is actually the name of the road in East Hampton where Jackson Pollock lived. And I hope you all know who Jackson Pollock is. And I hope you, if you don't, you need to find out immediately. I hope you also um, uh, know that, that he sort of started this tradition of uh, painting not on the wall where you are constantly moving back and forth, but painting on the floor where you are in the painting. So this was a concept that I was very much moved by at the time is, and that's why I was painting them on the floor because I didn't want to judge them. I wanted to be in them and I wanted them to represent who I actually was at that moment, at my best, not at my worst. We all have a huge range. Okay, next. <clears throat> this is another painting that I, uh, as a kind of a joke called uh, Sandwiches. You know, I thought it was a funny title because you're not supposed to make a painting about sandwiches. 
So that's a painting that uh, of the same type with different colors and different experiments in terms of different kinds of lines. Okay, next. So this is, this is from the same series, and this is a little later. This is uh, 1971. Incidentally, this is the, the early 70s, as probably none of you know, uh, were a period of tremendous excitement in the United States. And it was a great time to be young. Uh, certainly, I was influenced by Bob Dylan. Uh, I even did a painting called Dylan. Uh, the much more so, let's say, than the Beatles. I, I, I thought they were okay, but Dylan, I thought, was a genius. I thought Dylan, uh, to use that, uh, that quote about genius is a thing for which there are no rules, uh, Dylan expressed some of the excitement and some of the creativity of that period in his lyrics. And uh, it was just happened to be a very, very exciting time. Many people Perhaps it's sour grapes, I don't know. Many people who, uh, older people feel that it was in 1980 that the United States started to fall. Perhaps this is not a political conversation, so I won't go any further, but there was a huge shift in the United States in 1980. And the 70s, I would say were definitely the most exciting uh, period that I lived through up until now. And also what's interesting is that many books are being written about the 70s now, including Jonathan Franzen's new book, which is called Crossroads about the 70s. So this is a, this is a painting where I'm, I'm manipulating water, I'm manipulating edges, and I'm watching accidents and taking advantage of them. Okay, next. Here's the sister. This is a similar painting to the one that I just showed you, uh, which I called Butterfly, uh, working with large areas of color and no lines, colors just moving into each other, shifting and changing almost as you look at it. Okay, next, please. This is a very, very large painting, a very high painting, more of a square painting. Uh, and it doesn't really show that much in the reproduction. You know, the reproduction is just a, uh, a code to get an idea of what it looks like because the uh, impact of the painting is very, very much different than this because it's very big and it takes over. And that was another concept of large paintings in the United States at this time was that you couldn't, you couldn't escape the painting. The painting was bigger than you were, literally. So you had to focus on it. Okay, next please. This is named after a poem by, by uh, Dylan Thomas. <laughs> I was getting mixed up with Bob Dylan and Dylan Thomas. Uh, I think Bob Dylan chose the name Dylan because of Dylan Thomas, because Dylan Thomas was a poet uh, from Wales who was very, very popular in the United States, more in the 50s, he died in the 50s, but he, he spent some time in New York and uh, he was just a very great poet. So uh, he did a poem, which you, you certainly can look up, called Innisfree. And so I named the painting for that poem. So. This is changing from the pictures from 1969 and that I'm working with large areas of color, more like large areas of color that are slowly seeping into each other. And I'm also leaving the raw space of the canvas between colors in some cases. Okay, next. Now I'm gonna show you recent paintings. So this is, <laughs> This is like 48 years, I'm still here a lot, thank God, but this is, uh, now it's 48 years later and we had the pandemic, right? And I started a new series of paintings based on the early curve paintings. 
These are much smaller. Uh, they also have a water-based paint. And this is, this is one of them called Dominico. So um, they're like in the range of 30 inches by 40 inches. Very, very, for me, very, very small. Okay, next please. This is a small painting, which is right behind my head. You see in the room here, there's the painting. It's called Bleu, which is uh, blue in French. Again, using the, the curved shape and, and color, but in a much more uh, specific, much more specific way. I'm still taking advantage of accidents, but it's less obvious. I'm also tilting things. The edges are tilted. And in the more recent paintings I did, I usually had tilts because I was interested in showing that everything was askew, off kilter. You couldn't count on anything is what it kind of meant to me personally. Okay, next. And this is a little different. Uh, in the sense that I'm, I'm allowing more white to show through. Again, it's, it's just 27 by 50 and a half. It's acrylic wash on canvas and it's called CBW, which is short for Chelsea Boogie Woogie. And the reason I called it that, as Rebecca might remember, is because it relates to Mondrian's painting, Broadway Boogie Woogie, that we saw uh, at the Museum of Modern Art. So this was my version of Broadway Boogie Woogie as a very, very famous painting in New York. I hope some of you have seen it at the Museum of Modern Art, which is painted by um, Mondrian. Okay, next. <clears throat> this is called San Marco. And uh, again, 25 by 51 inches. Uh, this is actually, I wouldn't say it was based on it, but I had the idea sort of in my mind about Venice and St. Mark's Cathedral. I don't know if you've been to Venice. It's right there in the center of Venice in the, in the uh, right when you get off the Vaporetto there. And it has these columns and columns are spirally like that. And the columns, of course, are much more intense than that. Marble columns, which are sort of that kind of a khaki green and a magenta or porphyry. The color is actually called porphyry. So that's one of the thoughts I had when I was doing this. I have many thoughts, not just one thought, but that, that was something going through my mind, I would say. Okay, next. And this is, uh, this is a painting which has, uh, again, more white space. The color is more uh, separated. The color, are, uh, the color is separated and the white is more dominant. And uh, I had been working on it. These are like my early paintings I just worked on once. I had been working on this particular painting and all the recent paintings long, for a longer period of time. And, uh, so I had been, you know, uh, involved with the painting uh, for quite some time, and then I finished it. And I said, to, you know, there's a moment when I just say, "That's it. It's over. Done." And I, I will never touch it again. So I had, I had reached that point, and I know you'll all identify with this. I then went to my phone to see what time it was, and there were these bulletins coming on the phone saying that the Capitol had been attacked, the United States Capitol. So I, I sat there for an hour watching these unbelievable films of the United States Capitol being you know, attacked by hoodlums. And so I called the painting January 6, 2021. I don't usually have a title like that. Is that the last one? Oh no, there's one more. This is the first one I did of the series called Undulating. 
uh, which I held vertically. So this is the one that relates more closely to the early paintings that I first showed you in the sense that the colors are all connecting to each other. And it was interesting to revisit the theme uh, all this time later. Uh, in all the work I'm trying, I'm attempting to make a beautiful painting. I'm try, attempting to put colors and shapes together in such a way that it will evoke a sense of awe or happiness in the viewer. That's my talk. So uh, let's hear from you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, I think I can just like cancel the rest of the semester now. So that was great. <laughs> Does anyone want to ask questions? I'm gonna stop screen sharing. Let's see. Well, then put it back to the whole group. Sorry, what? Oh, you can just take the paint. Oh, do you want to leave the painting on or? Yeah, we can do that. Um, I had them submit questions. So I know everyone has some questions. Okay, great. Well, let's hear the questions they submitted. Um, you can just say them if you have questions. Aramel, I see your hand up. No. Go ahead. So what motivated you to create your early works? Was it the environment, life events, or a combination of both? Okay, wh which person is speaking? Aramel. Um, I'm sorry, can you say the name? Um, my, my name is Aramel. I'm out. No, I'll tell you, I have a, I, I like to see the person so I can just find you on this list here. You've got the yellow background there. Oh, hi. And your name is Amel? Or, uh, uh, Aramel. Oh, great. Thank you, Aramel. Go ahead. Let, so let's hear the question again. Okay. What might have been, what motivated you to create your early works? Was it the environment, life events, or a combination of both? Uh, so the first part was, was it the environment? What was the section, second part? On oh, um, the first part says, what motivated you to create your early works? Right. And then it was, was it the environment? And what was the second sentence? Life events or combination of both. Oh. It, it, no, I, I, I would say, I would say it was uh, looking at other art. I'd say it was looking at other art that motivated me. In other words, I, I was very interested in art or in painting from an early age and I studied it. And then I went around to galleries in, the, in that period when I was in school, graduate school, whatever. And I looked at paintings. And so I wanted to become part of that. I wanted to become part of the conversation. And abstraction was a fairly uh, let's say it was a fairly new thing. And abstraction was actually an invention in the same way as, uh, let's say, physics, Newton's physics is an, extent, is an invention. In other words, abstract painting didn't exist, let's say, before 1900 uh, with cubism and with Kandinsky. Now, th these are things you might not know about, but you must have heard of cubism. But in any case, to simplify it, because I know you're not art majors, Abstraction was having a painting that had no identifiable subject. That's a big difference because up until the 20th century, uh, all painting had subject. So I was very excited by the idea of abstraction. I thought it was, you know, to use a vernacular word, I thought it was very cool. It's like, wow, you could just use color and shape with you out of your imagination and make it up. So I would say to answer your question that I was, I was interested in connecting with the best art of the time. And I was also very interested in abstraction. Do, did that answer your question? Yes. Okay, great. Jamie. Hi. Um, I just had a question. I thought it was interesting how with the names and the meanings behind the paintings, but I wasn't sure if there's a method to like the meanings behind it, if you had that meaning in mind and then painted off of that or found the meaning after you painted it. That's a very good question. I, I found the meaning after I painted it. 
I didn't have the meaning in mind. That's, that's one of the things about, I would say about contemporary art in any, any form. And this writer, uh, she's actually not a great writer, I don't think, but she had a great remark. She said, I only wrote it down to see what was on my mind. Her name was Francine Duplexi Gray. In other words, she was telling the audience that she didn't really know what, we, what she was gonna write about. And it was only through writing that the idea came up to her. So of course that's true. And that's why abstraction is perhaps a little more revelatory because I didn't have, uh, I had some ideas obviously, and I stuck to them pretty closely because I, 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 I had certain structures that I wanted to work with. But I didn't, I didn't know what was going to happen. And that's what kind of makes it very exciting. And also I wanted to, you could say, you know, to be a little corny. I wanted to meet myself and see, well, actually, who am I? What, what am I going to do? And so uh, I, 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 the meaning, if there were, I don't, I don't know if there's a meaning. I would say in a lot of the paintings, there's an event. And the event came while I was painting. And I, I sort of recognized the event. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, anyone else? Okay, is it Paige? Yes. Hi, Paige. How are you? Um, I had a question about you using geometric forms and shapes like for your projects like what was like I remember reading one of your articles and they said it said that you use like geometric shapes and um or was geometric forms and bolder colors in your paintings yeah okay well that's very interesting uh <laughs> okay a a of course I didn't write that I hate the term geometric. I would never use the term geometric ever because it's a very, very limiting term. And uh, I don't want to be considered, a, uh, those are paintings I didn't show you. And there was a period when I was doing, let's you could call it more linear, more linear paintings. Uh, and I was working more, let's say with rectangular shapes, but this is a kind of a pigeonholing device. And I'm, I'm sure that as you get older, you will see that the culture uh, that we live in is very interested in pigeonholing and putting into labels. So they would call something geometric when I was never, it's not like I was sitting around thinking about geometry. I might've been using a rectangular shape to, as a way of putting two colors together, as a convenient way of putting two colors together but I wasn't thinking of geometry. And to go further on the topic, there was a painter uh, who was quite important named Barnett Newman, uh, who was the age of my father from my father's generation. And uh, he also used linear shapes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry about that, let me just turn this off. Uh, so he used linear shapes and, um, and there was gonna be a show at the Whitney and he was asked to be on the show and it was called something geometric painting. And, and uh, he said, Barnett Newman said, I refuse to be on the show unless you change the title to color field painting. And they refused to change the title and he did not, he did not participate in the show. So I think that shows tremendous uh, self-respect on his part. Uh, so if I used if I used rec twenty or images, and you know there were uh, articles written certainly, uh, I was using them because I was exploring. You know, I'm putting my hands up. I was exploring the place where two colors meet, and I, I thought that was a very sensuous place, like two people meeting almost. Good question. Thank you so much. Okay. Hello. Um, so my question is, how did you navigate yourself being a woman in the art world? Well, that 
is the question, isn't it? Now, I had that question today because I uh, earlier on the day, I had uh, some people visiting my studio who are in the field. And that, that's, that's the question now that I'm hearing the most, you know, and um, you can, I'm just going to give you this as an aside. Um, I did write two articles on this called Shoes Under the Art World, part one and part two. And part one is about is something about the experience of, of being a woman. And part two is what I discovered about female artists in the past from the 1800s down to the 1400s. So I'm gonna answer your question in a couple of parts. I'd say actually that in a sense, it's worse now than it was in the seventies. It's supposed to be better, but I, I don't experience it as being better. I experience it as being worse. And here's why. People weren't that intensely concerned about the topic. And so, yeah, I was a woman. I happened to be, you know, quite talented. No problem. I got into the best gallery in New York when I was 28. It wasn't, it was, you know, it was good. <laughs> but I didn't feel like, oh, this is huge. I'm a woman. I didn't feel like that. And, you know, then the question would be asked, you know, sometimes the question would be asked even back then, uh, you know, what do you think about being a woman artist? So I, I said, I, there's a couple of articles like that. I said, I don't think of myself as a woman artist. I'm just a, I'm a, I'm a painter. I'm not standing in my studio thinking, hmm, I'm a woman. Well, how does this affect me? I never, I, truthfully, I never thought about it. I just thought, let me try to make a very good painting. I never thought, and I wanna share this with all of the females here, there was never a day of my life that I thought I wasn't as good as any man. Never thought that. Why would I? It's an insult. So now we get to the reality, or let's say the current reality. The art world in particular, much more than other fields, is very, very misogynistic. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't aware of that. And I would say, again, it's become more so, not less so. Uh, and the reason I think it's become more so is because there's, there's so much emphasis on this now. It's like, what woman wants to be in a show called Woman Painters? You know what? I don't. I don't want to be in that show. I want to be in a show called Painters. I don't want to be segregated in any way or, or separated. I, I want to be considered as an artist. Uh, now, here's a fascinating thing. How do you pronounce your name? Shataya? Shataya. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No one could tell that a painting that I did was by a man or a woman. If you just put the painting up and you say, is that by a man or a woman? You can't tell. There's no way of knowing. So the whole thing is a little bit bizarre to make this huge a difference about it. Uh, and so that's, that, that's, my, uh, that's my conclusion to why even, even if people or some people are paying lip service to this, why in fact there hasn't been an improvement. And I also wanna add to this question, the issue that I consider to be, uh, let's say, uh, too easy, too easy, is women who do paintings about how much they're suffering as women. I find that cliche immediately, an, an automatic cliche. In other words, I'm not interested in people uh, taking advantage of their position to, uh, to gain uh, attention. I think if you want to be a painter, you try to be the best possible painter you are, can be. I mean, there were different periods when women were showing themselves with vacuum cleaners and they had aprons and, you know, there's a whole group of things. Now, I could be wrong. And believe me, <laughs> I'm, not my, I'm not giving you the, the majority position, I don't believe. But I'm giving you a position that has to do with 
a very long career and being totally alive in New York to the art world. So uh, I have to, what I have to fight more than, uh, let's say, uh, prejudice is I, I have to fight cubbyholing. And I think that's, that, that's part of the problem. Is there any other thing you want to ask me about that? Oh, no, you clarified it. So. <laughs> okay, great. What about all these people who don't have their selves on the screen? Yeah, where are you guys? Most of the class is uh, face. I, I can see that now. Yeah, no, I'd love to see these people. Turn on your cameras. Maybe they're not here. Yeah. Can they just put it up and then not be here? They could. <laughs> <laughs> How do they do that? I guess they could just walk away from their computer. Oh, right, right. What about you, uh, Elisa? We haven't heard from you. Hi, I can ask you a question. Um, this is kind of similar to one but that you just answered, but during your time in college and grad school in the 1960s, you said like women artists were not given the same opportunity as male artists. Um, has that like changed since then, like the opportunities? Or well, do you feel? No, I think maybe the opportunities have changed. I'll tell you one difference. One difference is I went to uh, I went to Hunter for graduate school, and it was really really good at that time. And uh, I, I had a very uh, a very brilliant and very exciting professor who was doing very well in the art world. His name was Tony Smith. Now, very often uh, people who teach painting in colleges are not are not really very exciting artists, and they are kind of hiding. Uh, or they, they got a job in academia and that's it. But Smith was right out there, you know, and do, doing very, very well. And to be totally honest, uh, I, was a, uh, I was a favorite of Smith's uh, and he was very excited about my work, except, and here's a huge except, when it came to giving me a job at Hunter, he didn't. He gave the jobs to all the male colleagues of mine, my age, who were in the program, and he didn't give me one. And what's even more astounding, astounding, is I didn't expect him to. I accepted that. It's just like, oh, women don't get those jobs. So that is pretty shocking, I would say. So that, that, that's one example where it was very obvious that the even the expectation of a woman was different from that of a man uh, at the same time. Thank you. I have a question. Um, okay. Hello. Who's being here? Okay. Is it, um, so, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Oh yeah. My question has to do with the the article you wrote about the the shoes under the bed article. First of all, I want to say that that article was really well written. I really enjoyed it. Um, I have a question towards the end of the article. You mentioned that your art dealer would like mention only your last name, and he wouldn't mention like, oh, it's a she or it's a female painter. Um, did that ever make you feel like upset or anything that um, he wasn't like fully saying that you were a woman or anything like that? Did that make you feel like less of a painter or like less valuable, I guess, in the art world? No, I tell you what I felt. Uh, and this is Margarita talking. Was that who it was? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I felt uh, <laughs> I, I didn't know. I didn't know he was doing that. You see what I'm saying? No, I think I think that he established in his mind 
that he had to do that in order to sell. And he never told me that. And I, I, I was surprised. I guess you could think that I, I, I think, and this is a little unusual, perhaps, I thought it was funny. Um, I don't think it's as funny now as I did then. What, what I will say, and, you know, I, I didn't have, I, I was quite young at that time, and I was just starting out, you could say, or I was just starting out. I didn't know, I didn't know that collectors, the people who buy the art, and they're, they're not usually average people. They're usually people with a, with a great deal of disposable income. They're called high net worth. And that's one of the real problems with the art world. Many of those people, even at that time, thought that it was not as good an investment to buy a woman's painting as a man's, even if they preferred the woman's painting because it would not appreciate in value. So I guess that that art dealer was, you know, banking on this person, not getting it that Pat Lipsky happened to be a, a female. How would you feel, Margarita? Um, I guess, like you said, I would understand the view of the, um, the person who was trying to sell the prints. Like at the end of the day, we live in like a, very so Margarita, we're losing you. And that, you know, it's helping you. Okay, sorry. I guess like I'm in an area with okay. really bad reception. Um, but can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, I said that I guess like I understand the viewpoint of the person trying to sell the paintings because at the end of the day, we live in a very misogynistic society. So I guess that to sell paintings, you have to do what you have to do. Like I would see his viewpoint too. That's right. He was doing what he was doing, what he thought he had to do at that time. Absolutely. I agree with that. And I think, I think you're right. Uh, I mean, I think it has come it has come to much more on the forefront uh, that that there's a very subtle attitude towards women in many instances that just wasn't perceived uh, back in the 70s uh, about, you know, uh, a kind of inbred uh, disdain that that only now is being, uh, let's say, studied. And I'm not talking about uh, the things like Cuomo, which I have very mixed feelings about. I'm talking about more subtle things, just that women sometimes are just considered uh, not as capable or not as smart, or they didn't they didn't build buildings, or how come they didn't do this and that. In other words, they're they're not given full credit for what they did do, you know, which was raise children and run a family, things like that, which were equally difficult. So somebody has a question, Ariana Nella. What's the question? Can you read it, um, Rebecca? I think I might have to stop screen sharing. Okay, great. Let's see. She said, having been part of the art world for such a long time, did you ever personally come to notice any major racial inequalities in the art world or in regards to the job of being an artist? Racial inequalities? Yes, definitely. Uh, big racial inequalities. Uh, in the 70s, uh, there were a couple of uh, African American uh, painters. One painter was called Al Loving. Uh, another, another painter was uh, British, I'm, I'm blanking on. Frank Bowling. It was it was again a kind of uh, just a perceived attitude that they weren't going to do as well. That was very very cruel in a sense, because they were just as intense and just as involved. I di I didn't feel that, and I was very interested in them, 
And, you know, we shared a lot of things in common and they were certainly my friends, but the attitude that you had in the, in the back of your mind was that somehow they weren't going to get the chance that somebody else was going to get for no reason, really. So yes, whoever asked that question, who is this person, Ariana, Nella? Yeah, hi. Yes, I, I, did, I did experience that. I did see that. I did see that. And I think, well, I think that, that's, it's not only has that gone by the wayside, but we're now in an extreme situation where uh, galleries and museums, and it's, it's just the other side of the same coin. Instead of just looking at work and evaluating work and forgetting anything about the identity or color of the person, it's now like every museum is almost entirely <laughs> collecting people of color and, and not anybody else. So maybe that's the United States. It, it just seems that we are a very extreme culture here and we go in one ex to one extreme to the other extreme. It's my perception. Good question. Did it? Did I answer it? Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. I'm still suspicious of all these uh, black screens here. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, right. No, this is. I, <laughs> you know, I teach on Zoom, and I can tell you that your teacher uh, is very, very lenient because I, I would just have a lot of trouble with this because I, I think when you're teaching, you want to, you want to see the students. I do. Let's see. Sophia, are you here? I am here. Ah, signs of life. Do you have a question? One second. I, I just want to look at the ones that I wrote down for okay. the assignment. Um, I have a question. Um, is there any subject in modern art that isn't commonly as portrayed as it once was? And if so, do you have a reason as to why? Is there any subject now in contemporary art that isn't being portrayed as much as it had been? And do I know why? Is that the question? Yes. Okay. Well, that's a good question. Interesting question. Yeah, many things. For example, uh, Christianity. Uh, the early paintings of the uh, of the beginning of the Renaissance, from the beginning of the Renaissance on were almost entirely re religious paintings, and they were almost entirely about the Catholic Church in particular. So Catholicism dominated painting from the earliest painters like Giotto, Cimabue, and Duccio. You know, you can just jot these names down if you're interested up until around the end of the Italian Renaissance. So that's a very fascinating reality of art history is that Catholicism uh, evoked this tremendous outpouring of paintings about Christ, the Madonna, the saints. And so, you know, for people who aren't even interested in that or aren't even Christian, these, these paintings give a whole feeling of, of religiosity uh, that is fantastic. Now you would never, it's just would never be done to do a painting uh, as far as I know. Uh, let's say this, it's very unusual to do a painting about Christ. I can't remember a painting I saw which had Christ. It, I, I don't remember it. it, it could certainly happen. So uh, religion, change so radically and our approach as human beings to religion change so radically that that's a particular topic that you never see anymore. Another thing to keep in mind 
is how different the world is now. And I'm always fascinated by this when I look at uh, older, older paintings, which I do a lot, is um, think about this, Sophia. There were no, there were no cars, there was no electric light, there was no running water. And even just think about being a painter when you didn't have electricity. That was, that was a very hard thing. You could only paint for a certain number of hours. You couldn't, you couldn't paint at night. You couldn't look at art at night. Uh, by around the time of Goya, which is the late uh, 1800s, uh, 1770, 1780, he actually had a hat which had little openings where candles could be put in. So he could paint a little later in the, in the afternoon or the evening with the candles lit. So no painting has the softness that let's say a Rembrandt did. And I believe it has to do with the lack of electricity. So that's how I would, that's another thing that I would answer is that it's something that is missing in our world. We will never experience it, which is a world which only had the light of the day and night. And so that's, that's missing from, from uh, art or so even a subject matter. So those are the two things that, that come to mind. I'm, I'm sure there are many, many other things. And, and as I said, abstraction changed painting, which that was in the 20th century around the same time as Einstein, E equals MC squared, uh, along with those kinds of inventions. Um, representational art, Certainly there's a representational art now, but it doesn't have the center position that it had up until then. In other words, 17th century, 18th century, 19th century, all people ever painted were figures, landscapes, still lives. And that's no longer the case. Any other question about that, Sophia? No, that was really interesting. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, who else? Let's see. John, are you here? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so why do you think that mediocre to poor art can suffer so much nowadays while many extremely talented artists go unnoticed? Can you say that once more, please? Sure. Uh, why do you think that mediocre to poor art can suffer so much nowadays while many extremely talented artists go unnoticed? That's a great question. How do you know that? Um, well, it kind of had to do with the article you wrote on Jeff Koons, so. Yes, perfect, wow. Well, that's, my, that's, that's the question I like most because I hate Jeff Koons. Look, I don't know Jeff Koons. And I actually wrote an article, maybe you saw the article, I don't know, but you can, you can look it up afterwards. It's called something like, it's okay to hate Jeff Koons. And- uh, I assigned that to them. Oh, okay, great. Okay, terrific. thank you. You did a very good job. So, yeah, so that is, you know, that is a mystery. That I am, I am mystified, and I am, I am very sad that that I have the answer to your question. Incidentally, I'm just getting to it. That this culture would would uh, would be interested in somebody like Jeff Koons. First of all, Jeff Koons started out as a sex artist. I don't know if I put that in the article. This is a fact: is that Jeff Koons, and it is shocking to know had videos of him and his wife having sex in a, in a gallery. That was the show. Who in their right mind would do that? So it became shock value. That's part of the answer, John. There's this tremendous up that people who know nothing get from shock value. Oh, look at Jeff Koons having sex. Instead of get me out of here, I don't wanna see Jeff Koons having sex. I have myself have no interest in that particular topic. And to think that that could replace 
the the idea of of excitement and beauty that comes when you look at something that's that's marvelous. So I think part of it is shock value. A, I think we're in a decadent period, and I, I believe that the decadent period started in around 1980, uh, although it might have been happening prior to that when other kinds of sexual things like masturbating. <laughs> This guy called Vito Akanchi. This is, this is when I was living in Soho in the 70s. I mean, I'm sorry to talk about this. Perhaps this is not allowed in a college class. I think it is though. This guy, Vito Akanchi decided he wanted to masturbate on the floor of a gallery in Soho called Sonabend. And that was the show. Now, I know that he actually did have the wherewithal to be on a lower level than the gallery, so you could just hear him. Now, a world where that is considered art is a decadent world. It's a very, very decadent world. Uh, the way it's described, John, is this, and it has to do with taste. One would say it's the taste that permits it. What you would hope is that in a better world, <laughs> when Jeff Koons went to the gallery and said, I'm gonna do a piece on masturbating, the gallery would say, Jeff, get a grip. Are you okay? Instead, the gallery said, great idea. Let's run it for a month. And so it's a, it's a lessening of standards and it's a perversion of what art was to a, the lowest common denominator, which art, great art never was, which is shock value. So the problem is, if I tell you that he did that piece, it's, called, it's actually even has a title called Seedbed. If I tell you that, you could be titillated for maybe till tomorrow morning. <laughs> and then you think, oh yeah, Masturbating, big deal. And so then the next piece has to come up. You know, God knows what that is. So Kuhn's actually, to my way of thinking, uh, is, uh, is a continuation of, well, first of all, I told you how he started. But, you know, when he sent this thing to France, which was a bouquet with his hand or hand holding a bouquet of flowers, that is just kitsch. Kitsch meaning uh, of low quality. The fact that the French government paid a few million dollars for it is what's surprising. Will it hold up? I don't think so. Meaning, will in 50 years when someone looks at it, will they think it's really good? I doubt it, but I, I probably won't be there to, to judge. Is there anything else on that question that you wanna ask me? No, I think that's good. Thank you. Terrific. You guys remember the hand? We looked at that in class with the balloons. Yeah. And I read them. There was a some critics said it looked like a bouquet of anuses. I read them that quote. So yeah. they remember that. <laughs> that's great. Well, Jeff Koons is, is one of these things which is completely and utterly mystifying. And the fact it, it, you have to draw some conclusions. And the conclusion you have to draw is that a lot of these rich people have no taste because they're spending like money like $164 million on some of this. Popeye. They're paying more money for Jeff Koons and auction than for a Rembrandt. So it tells you that we're in a very skewed world right now. And uh, this is not the first time, incidentally, because there was this thing called tulip mania in Holland in the 17th century, where suddenly tulips were considered to have a huge value. And like one tulip was, set, was selling for thousands of dollars. And it just went on and on and on. And then eventually it just stopped. Perhaps that's what we're seeing now. It seems to me as someone not in the art world that 
the like ultra wealthy are just viewing art as like a place to park money now and that it's not actually about the art anymore it's not about beauty well it's definitely not about beauty well let's say let's say i shouldn't say that because that puts me out of business uh there are people certainly who are interested in making uh, purchases and in being connected with beautiful art and with art that they think will last certainly I don't know anyone personally who is intrigued by Jeff Koons. Um, it's more like it's more like hip fashions, or it's like branding. You know, it's like if Kardashian is that how you say it? If if the Kardashian, <laughs> if the Kardashians buy a Jeff Koons, people who follow the Kardashians are going to be interested in that it's a very it's a lower it's in my lifetime i've seen a real hideous lowering of standards and uh, uh as you said mediocrity seems to be what is sought after perhaps because it's less threatening so we're about out of time here although I think we could go for hours more because this is fascinating. Does anyone have any last questions? Uh, yeah, I wanted to know if um, you would consider like the media to be an influence towards why these types of artists like Jeff Koons has so much like popularity in a sense or has so much like people looking for. So that's a great question. I, I think the answer is no. For this reason, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an authority on the media. I have to say that to begin with. Uh, some of the things that I've discussed with you, I consider myself to be an authority on. I just want to say up front, the media is not one of those things. Like I'm just beginning to figure out Instagram. Not that I necessarily want to. I think the media, like Twitter and uh what are, what else? What else is the media? Oh yeah, Facebook and Twitter and all of that. Uh, I think that's um, not an art world uh, pastime. I'm not saying people who are involved with the art world don't do the media. Maybe they do Instagram more than anything else. And I would say yes in the sense that the media has called, caused a general dumbing down. Definitely agreed that the media has caused a dumbing down of the culture. So the media has created a lesser standard. So that's one thing. And the media has taken too much attention from reading a book or going, or going to see a play. But the people who are investing these millions of dollars in Jeff Koons, I truthfully don't know what's on their mind. I can tell you that it's a mind very different from my mind, with standards that are very different. I don't know how they justify it. I don't know how somebody could spend, let's just call it $100 million. I know the exact number. How could they spend $100 million on a Popeye sculpture? I don't get it. Oh, or the other, the other thing that they were involved with was, um, uh, well, it was, oh yes, yes, Michael Jackson. You know, he did, a, he did a sculpture of Michael Jackson, which was uh, considered uh, tremendously important. Uh, it escapes me. It, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not beautiful. It doesn't reward aesthetic experience. It's not fun to look at. So what I would say I'm leaving, you know, in terms of uh, what I would like you to think about uh, in terms of your own life and your own experience is, if you, if you want to look at something and if you are, enjoy looking at something and if it gives you happiness, I don't like happiness, if it moves you, if it moves you, that's something you want to be looking at. But don't be intimidated by things that the culture is telling you you should look at when they have no value to you. Because you're right. I can tell you that right now. You're correct. The culture is wrong.
Pat, is there any, are there any artists today that you really admire that you feel are kind of going against these trends, these well, cultural trends? Me, I admire my work. Uh, um, I'm not, I'm not that up on the, on what the, uh, everything that's going on right now, to be completely honest. I certainly love, uh, there are painters that I love, but I, I would say they're more like, uh, people I've been influenced by in the past, like, like um, Mark Rothko, like uh, Morris Lewis, like um, uh, Kenneth Nolan. Uh, so, you know, there, there has been some, some great art. I, I would say that we're not in a period right now. I mean, we're not in a period right now where, where, uh, where one is where great art is thriving. And, and secondly, it's, uh, and this is true, I think in all fields, it's a very, very fragmented period right now. There's no dominating uh, idea like there was the Baroque or there was the, you know, the Renaissance. There's nothing like that right now. It's just a lot of pockets of art like going on at the same time. Um, and uh, I, I wish I could, I wish I could come up with a name where I could say uh, this person really achieved something that I think is meaningful. I just can't come up with a name right now. Do you have one that you think that you think has achieved a lot? Do I? Yeah. Um, I'm not that up with current art either. We were looking at um, Kahinda Wiley's work in class recently. I am not a fan of, of Kahinda Wiley. Uh, I think Kahinda Wiley has a fantastic story. Mm -hmm. Very impressed with what he overcame and uh, how he moved himself up. But I find his work, I'm sorry to say, vapid. I think the flowers with the figures are very, very poorly done. Uh, and I, the bottom line, which is what I just told your class is when I look at it, I wanna get away from it. I don't, I don't feel drawn into a Kahinda Wiley picture. Mm -hmm. I don't know what your experience was. I've certainly seen them in person and I've seen them, I've seen them over a period of time. And uh, I, I wish I could be, I, I would prefer to be more positive about it. But here's another thing about art. You never don't register your, your honest feeling. I would never say to you, I think he's great, even though I think that's the right answer. I would never say that because that's, that's a perversion of honesty. So I have to just give my honest response based on everything I know and my taste at the moment. But I'm interested that some of you liked his work and that you like it, Rebecca. Okay, do we have any other questions? All right, thank you so much. This was really incredible. And I will, I will send you the recording. Okay, terrific. And if anyone comes up with a question later, certainly feel free to email them, uh, email it to me. It was, a, it was very, very stimulating. And I, I enjoyed the questions that the students asked very much. You know, it will, it will you know, stay with me and keep me thinking as well. Because it's a give and take between different people, which makes culture. Great. Okay. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting Thank me. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much you. for inviting. Thank you. Thank you so much.